This week, I'm focusing on the handles of pots. In this case, I wanted to make some which matched more closely to the shape of the mug they're attached to. In the end, some work, and one is a total abomination. Perhaps even the most terrible pot I've made in recent history. But it's the process that counts, and sometimes you've got to make pots you hate in order to push you in the right direction. For these experimental handles, I've thrown four very simple cylinders, which, before a handle can be attached onto them, they need to be trimmed. These cups were thrown the day before, and then I left them out overnight to dry slowly to leather hard, after which I place these cups onto a chuck, which is the solid lump of conical clay you see beneath this piece. The chuck forces the opening of the mug to be perfectly round, and helps to hold it in place as I trim the walls and the base of the mug. Sometimes, if I trim too closely to the rim, I can leave a rather ragged edge just beneath the lip, which I really don't want. So, I flip the pot back the right way up, insert my spinner tool so it stays in place as I push down on it, and just soften that rough patch with the side of a smooth rubber kidney. With that fix, the pot can be placed back onto the chuck so that I can finish the rest of the trimming. This trimming process thins the walls out to make the pot lighter, whilst also giving me a chance to refine the throne form, which is especially useful for the base of the mug, as it's often one of the messiest areas of the pot, and where some of the last additional weight is. I use a long, flat, metal kidney to scrape over the walls, just to soften the marks left by the trimming tools, and to make sure the walls are perfectly straight. I made two mugs with more tapering forms, and another pair that were straighter, which are more akin to the usual mugs I make for my shop updates. As for the bottoms of my mugs, I always bevel this outer edge before flattening the base itself, flattening everything smooth with a rubber kidney, and then finally I stamp the pot with my maker's mark. This process of turning, where I trim away the outer surface of the pot, reveals stoneware inside that's a bit softer. This means if I were to immediately attempt to attach a handle to the pot just after it's been turned, there's a much higher chance I'll deform the shape of the mug as I press the lump of clay that makes the handle onto the cup. And this is especially true considering how thin I turn these. All this means is that after these pots have been trimmed, I can't attach their handles straight away, and instead I have to wait about 20 to 40 minutes so that the walls of the pot dry out enough in order to be able to withstand the pressure that's applied to them from the handling process. I tend to place them rim down initially, as if I were to place the freshly trimmed bases onto the wood, there's a chance the wetter clay here would be marked by the wood itself, whereas the rims tend to be more firm and can withstand being placed directly on the wood without being damaged. The next step is to pull a length of clay into a long strap which I can segment off into individual handle blanks. Each blank becomes a handle for a mug. Here's my plan. I want to attach handles onto these mugs that are slightly thicker than usual. I'll shape them in the normal way, and then once they've had the chance to firm up somewhat, I'll alter the handle's shape by poking them, stretching them, and even adding additional pieces of clay to them. Then, once the newly attached handles have turned leather hard, I'll carve them, shape them, and fettle them into a more angular shape, and one that would otherwise be impossible to pull conventionally. I know I'm probably going about this the wrong way, especially after going through this process, editing this video, and doing this narration. I could have probably just pulled thinner handle straps at this point, form those into the more angular shapes I want, and then attach them directly to the cups. And thus, the technique you see in this video is perhaps more convoluted than it need be. But that was learned through trial and error, and that's really often the case with handmade ceramics. It's very rare that you come up with the best solution straight away. And often, ideas are built off things you already know. Once the handle blank has been attached, I wet my right hand, place it towards the top of the mug, pinch, and then pull down. As the clay gets thinner and longer, I progressively close my grip so that the clay is forced through a smaller gap in my hand and becomes thinner and longer again. I hold the bottom of the handle and let it arc into place towards the base of the mug, whereupon any excess is snipped off. I then tidy up this bottom join by really firmly smearing some of that excess clay into the body of the mug before softening over everything with a wetted finger. That's the process in brief. 
But if you'd like to watch a way more thorough video about this process, which I'll leave a link to down in the description of this video. As a process, pulling handles has many similarities to pulling up the walls of clay when you're throwing a pot. It's all about consistency, both in how you move your hands and the position of them, the rate at which you move your hand and the amount of water used. The worst thing about learning to pull handles is often it comes at a time where your thrown pots are relatively good, yet they get ruined by bad handles. Which is why when I was learning to make them, I would often attach five or six handles to any one cup until they got to the point they were good enough to use. The thing is, your first 10 handles will most likely be terrible, yet your 40th and 50th will be many times greater than those first. One of the reasons I'm doing this is to see if I can make handles that match the shapes more closely, such as with this batch of recently thrown angular mugs where each form was different. Obviously, I have lots of control over how the pots look, yet the handles tend to have the same sort of shape over and over again. And so I just felt really inspired to create a batch of handles that pushed my limits as a maker and were more angular in nature. The glazes I use tend to soften the clay work beneath them. This means that if my handles are a tiny bit scruffy in places, it's often completely hidden by a layer of glass, which at least gives me hope that the most terrible of handles you'll soon see me make may somehow be salvageable. At this point, I'm now altering the shapes of the handles. It's been about 40 minutes since I pulled them and the clay is still soft and malleable enough to be gently moved around without the clay splitting or the joints on either end coming loose. Either way, the only benefit of attaching the handles like this and then changing their shapes is that the joints themselves are really solid and they flow nicely into the cup. Although I'll be changing that quite drastically in some cases. I'm not trying to do too much at this point and I may have to add bits of clay to the outside of the handle where it changes direction more noticeably as even though I've bent the handle into almost a 90 degree angle, it's still relatively curved. Although as I look back on this footage, perhaps just the hint of angularity is all these need, but instead I'm going to be taking them somewhere far more extreme. With the handles roughly shaped for now, I'll place them on a plastic lime board, spray them lightly with water, and then wrap them up tightly for the night. After being enclosed in a humid environment overnight, the pulled handles are more or less the same dryness as the bodies of the mug, and it's this slow, careful drying that prevents cracks from forming around the joints. And here are the four mugs and their four rough handles, which I'll soon be carving. This one, despite its strange pointy shape, is surprisingly comfortable to hold, perhaps as I can support it easily with my ring finger from underneath to help keep it upright. You can do the same with this one, as the handle slopes up quite sharply from below. I think if I were to try this method again, I would pull the handles to be even thicker than they are now, as there isn't actually much material left on these to carve away. To aid this process of carving the handles, I'll be using these sponges on sticks, or as they are often referred to in the ceramics industry in the UK, diddlers. These will be especially useful for smoothing over areas like this in places that are a bit more difficult to reach. The only downside of using a sponge on a stick like this, especially with a clay body that contains more grog, is that the sponge wears away the clay, but not the coarse specks of grog the body contains, which means that any area that is sponged needs to be burnished thereafter to compress these coarse lumps back into the clay body, as otherwise you're left with quite rough patches on the surface of the clay. I just added a small lump of clay to the outside of this handle, which I'll model into a sharper ledge to give the handle a more angular appearance. From this point on, this is a relatively slow process, so I'll only show you the most important snippets in real time. But essentially, I'm just carving the handle back very slowly, bit by bit, as if I try and cut away too much at any one time, that would exert too much force on the handle and there's a good chance it could be torn off. With the rough shaping done, I use my wetted finger just to fettle over the sides and top and force those sharper specks of grog back into the clay body. One down, three to go. As for this first one, I like how the outside form of the handle has a few sharper points, whilst the inside remains curved and comfortable. 
I really like the ergonomics of this shape too. The flat top is a perfect place to rest one's thumb and once again I can support the handle from beneath with my ring finger. This next one is the real challenge. When shaping this one, in my mind's eye, I envisaged a really sharp, triangular handle that juts out from the mug's body. In a way, part of me is interested in making handles that appear more sculptural, but I think what I have in mind for this one could be pushing it. Once again, I'm adding clay on the outside to create a sharp corner. And some 15 to 20 minutes later, I ended up with this monster. It's still a bit scruffy, but I won't tidy up the edges until it's dried out for a bit longer. And I just hope that once this piece has been covered in glaze, that the form is just softened slightly. Next, we have what's probably my favorite. And in the future, I think I'll be attempting the same handle, but pull them thinner initially, shape them like I did previously, and then just leave it like that, without all this added refinement and fiddling. This process of carving the handle and holding the pot can cause a number of things to happen as you're working. The first being that the shape of the mug might deform as it's held steady and the pressure of the knife is pushed against it. So I will be taking a measure to correct that afterwards. I also happen to have very warm hands and I feel like this helps to dry the clay out very quickly. So if I notice that any portion of the mug is beginning to turn bone dry, which I can notice when this dark pink hue changes into the color of the trimmings you can see in the tray. If I see that happening too much on the outside, I'll either spray that portion of the pot or wipe a wet finger over it. Once these handles are finished, I'll wrap them up again so they dry out really slowly. As when pots like this dry out unevenly, or too quickly, that's when things warp or cracks form where the handle joins the mug. I like the finesse of this one, but I think I should have left a bit more clay around the top join. Eventually it will be padded out by the glaze, which will make some difference. Otherwise, this handle feels really good to hold and there's easily enough room for two fingers to fit comfortably in. My only concern is that this specific handle on this shape of mug makes it feel a bit like a tankard, which as a type of vessel, I don't have anything against, but something just doesn't feel quite right here. This last handle maybe ended up being my favorite. I left enough thickness in it and it's sort of different enough to make it stand out. I press a small roll of soft stoneware onto the outside of the handle with a touch of water to help it stick. It's pressed on firmly, and then I smear the clay in both above and below. This newly added clay dries out really fast, and it only takes a few minutes before I can begin carving away. For this handle, I wanted the top portion of it to be flat, whilst the lower portion then curved back into the body. It's comfortable, it's a bit more striking, and I think it's going to work really well with the glaze. And I think I left an appropriate amount of clay in the top join to give it the appearance of being sturdy and strong. With all the handles now carved, they're placed back onto the chuck, centered, and then I burnish the bottom and clean up any smears of clay left over from the handling process, or specks of clay that have embedded themselves back into the base. Forcing the rim over the roundness of the chuck, also ensures the openings are nice and round. And as a group like this, I actually really like them. They're sculptural and different and feel like they were meant to be displayed in a row like this altogether. All of these will change so much once covered in glaze, which means in the future, I'm definitely going to make an updated video for these. Despite this one's absurd shape, it's actually rather pleasant to hold. Although due to how thin it is, I'm not comfortable holding it properly yet. I should have definitely left a bit more clay in this one as it feels a bit weedy and weak, especially in the tip here, but God knows what I was thinking otherwise. And finally, my favorite, for the reasons I explained previously. Of course, I would love to hear what you guys think. Making experiments like this and sharing them online is a rather strange experience, as often these first tiny steps aren't something most makers would share, as I think there's some degree of vulnerability in letting people see you fail and make mistakes and struggle potentially with your technical ability. Yet I think being able to watch this journey of exploration can be one of the most helpful processes in inspiring new work and letting you see where you actually went wrong, which when editing this back and adding the narration, I could really pinpoint the processes I'll change next time I do this. Anyway, the next step for these is to be sprayed lightly and wrapped up for one more night. 
The following morning, all I want to do is just tidy up the edges of some of these. Some were a bit rough in places, and the edges of the handles in some cases weren't quite as straight as I'd like. So I just used the side of a metal hole piercer, which is rounded and smooth, just to neaten them up. This might not look like it's doing anything, and truthfully, the glaze that's ultimately going to be coated over these and then fired into glass may have hidden these inconsistencies. But as their maker, I'd rather know that I'd already dealt with these, as opposed to just letting the glaze do everything for me. So, let me know which shape you like most, and I hope I can improve on this idea. This was a somewhat long and convoluted process, but by the second, third, and fourth time I've gone through it, it will all begin to feel way more natural, and many of the processes will be streamlined compared to what they were here. But I don't think I'll be making this one again. Thank you, as always, for taking your time to watch. And just a quick reminder that my book is still available to pre-order. And yes, that is a blurb by Seth Rogen on the back. I'll leave a link in the description of this video to where it can be purchased. And I can't tell you how much all of your support with this book has meant to me. And with that, I'll see you next week.